active mission in the places that we've already been put and in the lives of the people we've been put with, which I know is bad English, but it, it does communicate. So the five practices, we've already talked about seeking the kingdom. This, we've already talked about number two, hearing from Jesus in the gospels, letting him mess with us again. Going, holy cow, what if he meant that? <laughs> and most of the time that means somehow me giving myself for the good of others, just like Jesus did. Not for Jesus, but just like Jesus did. Uh, talking with people. Uh, again, that is a simple practice that we often do not employ. Uh, we talk with all kinds of people, but we don't all, all usually listen. We, we talk in order to use people. And I don't mean that in a, like, oh, we're all bad people for that. It's just the pace and what we've got to do, right? But what if we began to realize, wait a minute, that person I'm talking with to get something accomplished with, there's people at home that love that person, or at least a little, right? That person has hurts and hopes and dreams and fears. That person has God messing with them somehow, and I wonder what he's doing, right? You know how you get started on such a journey with a person? Let me, let me, let me, uh, this is a professional, so just be careful, okay? Oh, well, hi there, how are you? Well, go, I'm fine, thanks. Did you all take notes on that? <laughs> I noticed her, smiled at her, said, how you doing? And I was already moving away, right? I wasn't taking out my Jesus hose and seeing if she would admit to being a sinner so I could wash her down, right? Now, if this happened in a Starbucks that we uh, both got to on a pretty regular basis and I started recognizing her like, you know, you come here a lot, don't you? Just pretend like you do. Yeah. What, what's your favorite drink? Okay, well, actually, I do too. I'm a tall black guy. Actually, I'm not. <laughs> now that I think about it. But you know what I mean. So uh, what's your name? What's that? Ellen. Ellen. Well, for heaven's sakes. That happens to be a very favorite name of mine because I have a daughter named Ellen. My name is Greg. Nice to meet you. We'll see you. Enjoy your coffee. Did y'all get that? Did you write down how that worked? Okay. Now, the next time I come, uh, I, already got, I already got an idea because, I mean, it's easy. She's Ellen, right? It might be a week later. I'm like, oh, Ellen, how are you doing? Oh, your daughter. oh, she's doing good. She's a real pain in the butt, but I love her dearly, <laughs> right? I mean, be honest. And, uh, and you, you probably, she would probably like, and what, what's your name? I'm like, Greg, right? Or if I don't remember because she didn't have a name I remembered, right? I'd be like, uh, I remember I like you, but I can't remember your name. It's what? Ellen. Okay, so that was a little over the top, but you got the idea. Now, here's what you need to understand. We are much, much closer to having a kingdom encounter simply because we're no longer anonymous strangers. Has she gone over the hump and now she's the Calvary and now we're celebrating her back? No, but you are much further along simply because you took up the practice of talking with somebody. Is it my job to then, you know, figure out what the whole rest of the thing? No, that's Jesus' problem. But if he keeps putting her across my path, what's my job? Enjoy her. And start watching. Start asking. I wonder what God might be up to with her. Maybe ask a question or two. And uh, you just never know what might happen. Now, if you never do this, this sounds like a weird practice. All you got to do is try it, and you'll start to realize how, how, how easy this is. And you say, well, I'm an introvert. I don't do that. You, you don't notice people? You don't smile? Come on, live a little, right? I didn't say open your life up. I just said notice them and smile. And, uh, and that's where the relational pace at which you go is the one that God's given you. So go ahead and just go at that pace. But do follow Jesus, right? And then the, the doing good, that, that's like that little old man that I told you about. I, I, I got a new story. I got a new story that I just got. I was just in Chicago, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and the, 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 the pastor happens to be a dad, and he has a son who just graduated uh, high school and now is off to college. And I was talking about these things, and, and he started choking up. I'm like, whoa, what's wrong, dude? And I didn't say it quite like that. I was more tender. I was like, I can tell you are troubled in spirit. Um, <laughs> But the point is, I noticed, right? And I stopped, and I'm like, what's going on? He said, i got to tell you this story. So 
he's got a guy that lives next door to him named John. And John is far from God and not really interested in talking with Dave, who's the pastor, about anything. Because it's like, you know, we crossed the line of high, and then I'm, I'm sure you're going to like try to sell me Jesus, and I'm just not interested, right? Well, it just so happens that this John was at the National Honor Society induction ceremony. And there was a young lady who had some developmental problems, probably some, some kind of autism, where she was very smart, but her ability to interact socially was really inhibited. And she had gotten into the National Honor Society, so they asked her to get up in front of this fairly large crowd and, and tell a little of her story. And she got up and she was telling her story, but what she also said was that how hard it was to get up every morning and come to school because she knew that it would be just another day full of people looking at her funny, making fun of her, and she really had a difficult time getting up and even coming to school. She said, except for Dan, uh, Ben, that's his name. Ben, Barber, who every day would come up to me, look me in the face, smile at me, and ask how I was doing. Now, Ben happened to be the pastor's son, right? John was there, who wanted nothing to do with religion or Jesus or Bob the past or uh, Dave the pastor. But when he heard about what his son did for this young lady, and the huge difference just noticing her and smiling and saying, how are you, made for her every day that she was able to get up and come to school and take all the other crap one more time. That was enough to have him come over and say, that was pretty cool, Dave. And they never became real good buddies, but the kingdom came a lot closer to being manifested for John simply because the son noticed, and he didn't change the girl's autism, he wasn't able to stop everybody else from making fun of her, but he was able to do good and thus manifest the immediate presence of the kingdom of God in a way that she could experience. And that's what we're all called to. And it really is that simple if we'll simply repent and believe the good news and take up that practice of doing good when it's within our ability. Right? And then the last one, ministering through prayer. That's really good. Ask pastor about that. We already talked about it in other situations. And I'm mindful now that I'm running out of time. So the uh, positioning and supporting two, environment, uh, two, two environments. So if I am somebody that has been told about these five practices, and I'm like, gosh, I can, I can, I can do this. This is within my reach, but I need some help. I need some support because I'm going to forget, and I'm going to get distracted, and I'm going to get stuck, Right? So what we want to do is we want to create an environment where people who want to learn how to enjoy people and seek, recognize, and respond to Jesus have a place to support each other as we're learning to do this outside of religious services and programming. Okay? So what we do then is with the number two, the missional community, is we take those five practices and we have five questions. So this isn't a Bible study. You go to a Bible study for Bible study, okay? Keep going to whatever Bible study you're going to. But there's a group of people that maybe live near you who want to start to say, I want to become a Jesus follower in the real world. And what we'll do is we'll get together and we'll start to ask each other these questions. So how have you seen God at work this week? And the first time you get together, invariably, most everybody's going to get together and go, nuts I wasn't paying attention <laughs> but just knowing I'm coming together with this group of people and getting asked the question guess what now I'm going to start paying attention right I'm just looking for what's already happening I don't have to make anything up and I come back mostly with questions I'm not sure this was God but this is what I saw well what do you think if that was God what do you think he might have been showing you what do you think he might have been asking of you right and by simply asking the question of one another and giving a chance to tell the stories as we have them, a lot more is going on than when we were doing it the old way, right? Or what has God been teaching you in His Word this week? Or any of these other ones. By simply being asked the question, we now are more likely to value the practice. And, and even if I come and I don't have any stories and I'm not getting this, but I keep coming and you four or five other people are coming and you're getting it, 
you're inspiring me that it's real. Because I'm hearing your stories and I'm getting it and I'm starting to realize that kind of stuff's going on in my life too. And I'm still wrestling to understand and interpreting it how it might be God. But you guys are showing me. You guys are teaching me. You guys are inspiring me. Right? And so what we have learned, the hard, slow way, but I'm giving you a quick you know, uh, course on it, right? Is that by telling our stories, we enhance the value. And by enhancing the value, we increase the desire to go out and actually give this a run, to put this into practice, to see what happens, right? Which will lead to what? Will lead to stories, right? So stories lead to increased value. Increased value it leads to increased participation in practices. And guess what? When you seek him, you'll find him. When you seek him more, you'll find him more. (laughs) When you talk to no one, you'll find out nothing. When you talk to someone, you'll find out more. And as we begin to trust that, that which was first weird and uncomfortable becomes something you can't wait to gather together to, to hear the other stories and to tell your own. You know what we call our missional community in League City? a Jesus party. Yeah. So now this is not uh, mandated. This is not part of the program. I'm just giving you like a little hint. If you open wine or mix margaritas, it makes it more fun. <laughs> I'm just saying. Okay. And, uh, and, 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 and we honor the Lord. We do. We don't get silly about it. But, but here's what we say. You know, Jesus turned water into wine. I mean, right? We're Lutherans. We go with that. Um, and, and so just in case, I always ask Jesus, if you don't want us to drink wine, turn it back into water. <laughs> and I go ahead and wait a few minutes just to give him time if he needs it, right? And, uh, you know, so far, so far. But all kidding aside, what we're doing is we're not coming together for a class. We're not coming together for a meeting. We're coming together to, to, to say, what did you catch God doing out there? And what's he inviting you to do in response to it? And dear friends, it is fun. And it is costly. But it always is more fun than it is costly. In terms of finally living the life that we've been thinking about, preaching about, talking about. And now we're actually in the middle of a story. Where little by little we see the kingdom being manifested. And lives being touched and changed. And all we did was start asking each other these questions. It led to me being more intentional about giving it a run. Going, I really don't like talking to people, but I've seen this person six times. I think God's trying to tell me something. Right? So here's the the latest thing that happened to me. Uh, So I go around the country talking about this, right? So I'm out in my yard, and there's a guy that walks by with a dog. And then, like a week later, I see him again. And then I start noticing that this guy is walking past, past my house every day with his dog. And uh, every time I'm there, I'm like busy. I'm like, oh, I, I act like I don't see him. And I get done with whatever, whatever I'm doing, right? Uh, uh, a week later, I, the guy comes over to my fence. It's a, like, a, like a, you understand what I'm saying? <laughs> 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 it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a, a, a metal fence that you can see through, but you can't get through. No, it's not chain link. It's, it's more decorative than that. But the point is, the dogs is, yeah, sure. The dogs, the dogs are like rubbing noses. That's, that's a sign of friendship. So um, here's, here, here's, okay, my dog is better friends with this man than me. <laughs> and, and I was like convicted by that in a good way. And I'm like, holy cow, uh, doggone it. I, next time I see him, I'm going to go out there and make sure. What's that? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Is this what it's like for you? Cause that- There's a lot more going on now simply because we know each other's name and that started. I have no idea what's going to happen. But, you know, if, if God could use Balaam's donkey to get, it, to get the point across, God used my dog. Okay. So, by telling our stories in any of those five areas, it's kind of like God's already up to stuff in our lives. He's already showing us stuff. It's like dots on a page, right? Connect the dots. And yet, when we're simply in our own head, right, it it tends to be this big mess. 
We don't see any pattern. We don't see any meaning. It's just like, ah, right? And yet when I actually get asked questions and I get a chance to talk about it, the mere talking about it brings clarity, right? And, and a sense of even more being convinced of what I think I may be supposing to do. And that then leads to me understanding what really is going on. That even though it may not be easy and may not be fun, God's in the middle of something. And he's wrestling with me. He's showing me something. He's messing with me, right? And that can be a, a horribly important thing. So with all that, um, I'm, I'm going to skip this. Oh, you, all you fill-in-the-blank people. All right. <laughs> I, I forgot. There are detail-oriented people. You have no idea, no idea what this means, but I have my blank filled in. Um, and, uh, and, and Pastor can talk to you about that. Uh, that, was, that was more for the leaders, but it's... Okay, got it. So um, real fast, though. When we talk about discipling people, Western Church and Lutherans are, you know, in the middle of that group. That's how we think we, we disciple people. If we just tell them stuff, we're done. So all of, our, all of our discipling is set up around delivery of information. And then when you look at all the rest of the churches, uh, we all see we're in this together, right? So if you go to the Christian bookstore and ask for something to disciple people, what will they sell you? A book. Inform Maybe it's a video which simply shows you information. <laughs> but the point is, it's all information-based. And yet Jesus didn't disciple anyone with simply information, right? In fact, he warned against that. He who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like the fool. And yet we've based our whole structure of discipling on that very fallible uh, premise because it's not just information it's imitation come follow me let's learn what this looks like in real life come with me and let's give it a run and see what we learn or you go off that way and try it and i'll go off that way and try it let's come back together and talk about what we found out what what did god show you what did god teach you who'd you talk with what good did you do and what happened when you did it and then as we continue to not only have information, but then the, that imitation, which is something that these missional communities provide us with, right? The opportunity to go out and give it a run and find out what happens and imitate one another and imitate Jesus. Then integration, which is that we finally have all of this begins to not be so weird and, and uh, unfamiliar to us, but now becomes a lifestyle. Seeking the kingdom is no longer something I, I have to like try to remember to do it's something I'm always doing. Why? Because Jesus said, seek first the kingdom. What if he actually meant that? <laughs> right? Um, I'm always looking for, for uh, uh, how I might be able to uh, notice somebody and say hi to somebody and see what might happen. Those kinds of things. Okay. And then finally, on the, the next page, this is about enjoying people. And um, we'll, we'll try to be done with this in just a couple minutes. So, you know Mr. Rogers, right? Yeah. Mr. Rogers was a megalomaniac, right? Mr. Rogers' neighborhood means I'm in control of all things, right? No, it wasn't about him being in control. It was about him having a heart for his neighbors, <coughs> right? So we need to start not trying to be in control of the spiritual destiny of our neighborhood, which will just overwhelm you and, and stymie you in the, in the very first place, but rather to have a heart for my neighbors even if I don't yet know them, right? So what we want to quick say is, how do we get to know people that we don't yet know? And the answer is, not all that hard. So here's the, the simple formula for neighboring. And it's simply unhurried time, plus proximity, plus activity, usually involving food is a good idea. Again, very Lutheran, um, equals conversation. If you connect, if you put these ingredients together, you will see people start talking, even though they don't know each other, right? Trust me, we've done it hundreds of times, uh, not just me personally, but now many, many people in many, many places. You do that, and that's the, that's the beginning of community. It's the beginning of conversation, and then you multiply that over time, not every week, not even every month, but every once in a while, you create this environment, a barbecue, wine tasting party, 
uh, Christmas, Christmas cookie exchange, whatever it might be that puts you in proximity of other people so that you can just like hang out a little bit, you're going to end up with friendship over time. And isn't that exactly what everybody needs in your neighborhood? That used to happen naturally. I'm just here to tell you as an ambassador of good news, it can still happen with a little intentionality. And it's not that hard. It's actually a lot of fun. I told the story when I was with some of your leaders uh, uh, earlier that in uh, 2007, I moved into my neighborhood. Nobody knew each other. We all lived within 100 feet of each other, and nobody knew each other by name or, or, or even sight in some cases. It's like, there's somebody that lives there, I'm quite sure, but I've never actually seen them. And so we started to say, how are we going to meet these people that we can't even get our hands on? And the answer was, fun. Okay, and barbecue. Uh, so uh, we sent out, and we played dirty. We sent out an invitation, right? And then we had a slow cooker that just wafted this amazing scent over the neighborhood all day long. And sure enough, we came together, unhurried time, proximity, uh, a little food. And, uh, we, and I'm not advocating this. We didn't mean to have this happen, but over 80 people showed up. And after about three hours, there's conversations everywhere. People who didn't know each other from Adam are connecting and laughing and conversing and finding out all the stuff that they generally had in common and, and appreciating the stuff they didn't have in common. And again, I won't advocate having a, a party for 85, you know, out of the chute. But I'm just saying that if nothing else shows that there is this hunger and thirst, no pun intended, uh, for community that everybody's kind of given up on, but everybody wished they had, right? Now, that was 2007. One year later is September 2008. And we had another little storm called Hurricane Ike came right into our area. And I want to tell you the difference it made that we had a bunch of neighbors who came together and helped each other get our homes ready for a hurricane rather than a bunch of separated strangers desperately trying to get their houses ready by themselves. Now, did we know that that was going to be something that was going to be an un un unanticipated blessing of having a barbecue a year before? No, but it prepared the way as few things else could simply for us to go, hey, guys, let's, let's get together and let's do this. And teams, a team of eight guys went from house to house to house. And we had it down to about an hour and a half to get all the hurricane panels all, off and then off to the next one. And we had cuts and we had, you know, smashed fingers and we had tired legs from going up and down the ladder. But guess what we had? Community. What a lot of people have given up on, but is within our reach if someone like you or me just decides to have a little fun from time to time, right? And it gives you an excuse to experiment with margarita mixes, see which one's the best one. Uh, okay, so, um, so uh, what can that look like in your neighborhood? That's my neighborhood, but I don't know what it'll look like in your neighborhood, but what does it look like to get folks together, right? But I'm just telling you, proximity, unhurried time, little food, right? We, we used to have guys drive into their driveway and shut the garage door as fast as they could. Now, and granted, this is a few years later, but now, not every week, but every, every couple of weeks, there's like, a, like an impromptu happy hour. Somebody brings out the, mar the, the blender. Somebody brings out a, a, a cooler of beer. Somebody has uh, some wine coolers or whatever those things are. And, and now, that it's just impromptu. And, we, and we're like, Yay! And we come together, and people drive in their driveway, still go in as fast as they can, but now they're running in and putting on their shorts and flip-flops and coming back out because they don't want to miss out on the fun. And within that melee of people becoming friends, I can tell you about the spiritual conversations I've had. Not one of them did I bring up. I can tell you about all the people we've prayed with. Not once was it my idea. I, it was my idea in the sense of I w ended the conversation with, can I pray for you? But they were basically pouring out their life, and either I was going to end it with, geez, that's tough luck. <laughs> or, man, that's something, can I pray for you? Right? Um, and I'm, this is not why we did all that, but then the latest thing is this past Easter, right, a few weeks ago, uh, on Monday of Holy Week, my daughter was playing, seventh grader, playing our little tennis team, you know, spring tennis for the school. And one of my neighbors, just around the corner, his daughter plays on the team too. 
and he's not a church, they're not a church family. They don't, they, they believe in Jesus, but they just haven't gotten connected with a church. And he comes over to me and he's like, man, where, what are you doing for Easter? And I said, well, we've got a congregation downtown that we've joined and we're looking forward to doing that. And he's like, ah, oh, and I'm not saying this is mature. He's like, oh, that's, that's, that's too far away. And we then we suggested a couple other ones, and he's like, no, no, nah, we, nah, nah, nah. and then finally he says, Greg, why don't you have a service in the neighborhood, and that'd be that, that'd solve everything. And I'm like, oh, ha, 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 very funny. And uh, you know, well, uh, then he's like, no, really, think about that. I'm like, oh, okay, well, I'll think about. It. But the very thing I'm, I I don't want to do, right, is to play in the prototypical pastor living in the neighborhood. I know, let's have a worship service. Won't that be fun? But. God's already at work. So first of all, my wife has an irritating habit of, of confirming the things of God to me, which I really wish you wouldn't do. Um, <laughs> it'd be easier to ignore God if she just would be quiet. Uh, but she's like, Greg, I think you really should think about that. And I'm like, woman, shut thou thy mouth. No, I didn't, <laughs> no I, I didn't say that. Now, first of all, I'm here to tell the story, and if I'd have done that, I'd be dead. So, but, but I'm like, so I still was not comfortable with it, so I went home, and sure enough, one of these impromptu little happy hours is going on. So I go over there and, and uh, grab a beer, and I'm talking with a couple guys, and I said, Carrie, you know, around the corner, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, well, he thought we should have a, uh, a, a sunrise service right here, and we had like a green space. And I'm like, you know, what do you think about that? Like, you know, of course, that's not my idea, right? And if these two guys are like, cool. I'm like, oh, great. Um, <laughs> well, sure enough, from about 7 o'clock that night, uh, it, just, it just got loose. And on Easter Sunday morning at sunrise, 7.01, there was about set, uh, 55 people that gathered with their lawn chairs as the sun's coming up and were able to read the gospel of Matthew uh, chapter 28, the resurrection. We're able to have some prayer. We're able to be thankful for the resurrection of Jesus. And we're able to encourage each other as neighbors that Jesus is alive and he's real. So when we forget that, don't be afraid of reminding each other that. And it all took about a half hour. I knew it was over because at a certain point, the sun got above the house across the street. and All of a sudden, we're all blinded. And I said, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <laughs> um, but, but as, first of all, I didn't have to do any of that. I mean, it, 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 it came upon us. And yet as a neighborhood we crossed a very important line that now is a part of our story, okay? Now, I didn't set up uh, weekly services at 8, 15, and 11 every Sunday. No. We're going to wait and see what, what God shows us to do. But the point is, he showed us to do that. But we never would have gotten there, ever, had we not started with a neighboring environment where a bunch of strangers could have a beer and have a little barbecue and have a conversation. And then a few folks, forget that I'm a pastor, it has nothing to do with it. It's harder as a pastor, actually, to start to watch for, respond to what Jesus is already doing in people's lives. That completes my presentation. Thank you very much. <laughs>